That night, Patrick was sitting alone in the Gryfinder common room. He couldn't believe that the Gryfindors had deemed him inferior to Harry Potter just because they saw Harry as the hero. But Patrick knew that Harry hated being known as the boy who lived, and he would have been miserable had he gone into Gryfinder as he was supposed to. No wonder Harry chose Ravenclaw, Patrick thought to himself. There, they see him as just another student and not a hero. Harry seems to be happy there and he has better friends than what I had with Ron and Hermione. Just then, Neville came into the room, saying, Patrick, are you okay? The sudden intrusion startled Patrick, causing him to jump in surprise. He glanced up at Neville, his face a mixture of emotions surprise, relief, and a flicker of something deeper. Neville. Yeah, I'm all right, he stammered, his voice unsure. He hesitated, the weight of his recent discovery pressing down on him. Should he confide in Neville? The thought of companionship and a listening ear was tempting, but the burden of his secret felt heavy. Could he trust Neville with this? You don't sound like you're okay, said Neville. He looked around as he said, I heard what they said about you, they think you're inferior to Harry Potter. That's a lie. Patrick flinched, his carefully guarded secret exposed like a raw nerve. Relief flooded him, warm and unexpected, chased quickly by a fresh wave of shame. He mumbled a reply, his voice barely audible, I know, he muttered, scuffing the worn rug beneath his feet with his worn shoes. But it doesn't matter that I know. It still hurts how they treat me. Patrick frowned as he continued, Did you hear that Chauncey Barlow recently left Gryfinder and went into Slytherin? Neville's eyebrows shot up in surprise. Really? Chauncey Barlow. But why would he even consider leaving Gryfinder, let alone for Slytherin? Those two houses practically despise each other. Patrick said, to be honest, I don't think Chauncey was happy being in Gryfinder, not with how rotten they had been to him while he was still here. Neville pondered this for a moment, a thoughtful frown creasing his forehead. You have a point, he admitted. Maybe Gryfinder wasn't the right house for him after all. Slytherin might be a better fit, especially if they value him more. A flicker of uncertainty crossed Neville's face, overshadowed by a hint of something, envy. Though, I can't imagine Gryfinder without hearing Chauncey laugh. It livened up even the dullest meals in the Great Hall. Neville paused, a beat of silence hanging heavy in the air between them. Maybe, he said slowly, his voice barely above a whisper, maybe the sorting hat doesn't always get it right. The words seemed to carry more weight than Neville intended, hinting at a deeper dissatisfaction with his own placement in Gryfinder. Oblivious to the scrutiny they were under, Patrick and Neville continued their conversation, their hushed tones laced with a newfound sense of vulnerability. Meanwhile, Ron and Hermione, concealed by the doorway's shadow, eavesdropped intently. Hermione's brow furrowed in a stormy disapproval, her sharp mind dissecting every word, every implication. Ron, on the other hand, wore a mask of bewilderment. Unlike Hermione's immediate censure, Ron grappled with the weight of their conversation, particularly the news of Chauncey's defection. This unexpected development sent a ripple of unease through him, prompting a silent question, could such a thing happen to him too? Was Gryfinder truly the best house for everyone beneath its scarlet and gold banner? At the same time, Chauncey was sitting in the Slytherin common room talking to Sandy. Sandy said to him, I'm surprised that you left Gryfinder, like what brought that about? Chauncey shifted uncomfortably in the unfamiliar emerald green surroundings of the Slytherin common room, a stark contrast to the warm reds and golds he'd grown accustomed to in Gryfinder Tower. Just this morning, he mumbled, avoiding Sandy's gaze. The sorting hat never placed me here, but I requested the change. Sandy's eyes widened in surprise. Wow, that's bold. Dumbledore must have been surprised. Chauncey shrugged, a hint of defiance in his posture. Maybe. But Gryfinder just wasn't where I belonged. 
It felt too loud, too reckless for me, he admitted, a flicker of longing crossing his face, before it was quickly masked by a steely resolve. Here, in Slytherin, I sense a different kind of belonging. A place where ambition and cunning are valued, not just reckless courage. His voice held a hint of bitterness, a veiled jab at the Gryfinder traits he never quite felt aligned with. Besides, he added, a sly smile playing on his lips, Slytherin has its own advantages. I can't wait to see the potions lab. The last sentence was laced with an unspoken promise of future adventures, a hint of intrigue about the secrets he might soon unravel in his new house. Just then, Sandy's sister Mona walked into the room, saying, Is it true that you left Gryfinder? Yes, said Chauncey. They never really liked me there, so why should I be loyal to them? After all, they only pretended to like me, just as they pretended to like Patrick Harvey, and they hate Harry Potter, because he's in Ravenclaw instead of with them. I see, said Mona. I think it's time for us to take some extreme measures in dealing with the Gryffindors. Chauncey's bravado faltered slightly at Mona's words. The playful glint in her eyes, usually a source of amusement, now sent a shiver down his spine. Extreme measures, he echoed, a tremor in his voice betraying his sudden unease. What exactly did you have in mind? Mona's smile widened, but it lacked its usual warmth. It was a smile that sent a jolt of unease through Chauncey, a promise of something darker, something more unsettling than friendly rivalry. Let's just say, she drawled, her voice taking on a dangerous edge, Gryfinder is about to learn the true meaning of Slytherin ambition. And maybe, she added, her eyes flashing with a chilling glint, they'll learn that loyalty isn't a one-way street. Chauncey swallowed hard. He reveled in the idea of sticking it to Gryfinder, of proving they didn't deserve his loyalty. But Mona's words hinted at something far more elaborate, something that danced at the edge of school regulations and fair play. A cold dread pooled in his stomach, a sudden apprehension replacing his earlier bravado. Oh boy, Sandy said with a huge smile on his face. I can't wait to see what idea you come up with, Mona. Maybe you can convince Harry Potter to fight them. Or we can, said Chauncey. As far as I know, Harry is just itching to fight the Gryffindors. A lot of them already hate him for not joining them, so what better reason why he should help us deal with them? A mischievous glint echoed in Sandy's eyes, mirroring Mona's. Harry Potter, huh? That's an interesting proposition, he mused, stroking his chin thoughtfully. He's certainly got the talent for magical combat, and let's not forget his grudge against Gryfinder for the whole sorting hat debacle. A flicker of uncertainty crossed his face. But is he really the type to stoop to Slytherin tactics, even against his least favorite house? Chauncey puffed out his chest, a touch of bravado returning to his voice. We'll convince him, he asserted. He owes us for not joining their little pack. Besides, everyone knows Gryffindors are arrogant bullies. A lesson in humility is long overdue. His bravado, however, couldn't quite mask the underlying apprehension that gnawed at him. Mona's brand of ambition, while intriguing, felt dangerously close to recklessness. A part of him, the part that had yearned for acceptance in Gryfinder, flinched at the thought of using Harry as a pawn in their scheme. But the other part, the part that still stung from Gryfinder's rejection, clung to the idea of payback. He shoved down this unease, resolving to deal with it later. For now, the thrill of revenge was too tempting to resist. Right, Mona said, a steely glint in her eyes. Let's formulate a plan. We need something that will strike a blow at Gryfinder's pride, something that will expose their weakness for the whole school to see. She scanned the room, her gaze flickering between the two boys before settling on Chauncey. And Chauncey, since you seem to have a personal vendetta against your old house, Perhaps you'd be willing to play a little double agent. I'm not too sure about the double agent thing, but I already know a handful of people in Gryfinder who would be eager to take them down a lot, 
said Chauncey, Patrick Harvey is one of those people. Across the castle, bathed in the soft glow of the Ravenclaw common room's enchanted ceiling, a different conversation unfolded. Harry, Philip, Eleanor, Duncan, and Candace huddled around a table, their faces animated by the day's events. Professor McGonagall's forum, intended to foster unity between the houses, seemed to have backfired spectacularly, thanks to Gryfinder's blatant snub. Honestly, Eleanor huffed, her brow furrowed in annoyance, the Gryffindors can be so insufferable sometimes. Don't they understand the importance of house unity? Harry chimed in, a thoughtful expression on his face. There's more to it than that, Eleanor. Remember what we discussed about Patrick Harvey and your brother Chauncey. Gryfinder seems to be fracturing internally. Maybe their absence was a sign of deeper issues within their own house. Duncan, the ever-skeptical Ravenclaw, offered a different perspective, his voice laced with suspicion. Perhaps, he said, stroking his chin thoughtfully. But it could also be a sign of something more nefarious. Gryfinder might be plotting something, something they don't want the other houses to know about. His words sent a ripple of unease through the group. The idea of a clandestine Gryfinder plot added a layer of intrigue to the already tense atmosphere between the houses. Could Duncan be right? And if so, how would it intertwine with the brewing conflict brewing between Gryfinder and the newly emboldened Slytherins? The possibility of a hidden agenda from Gryfinder cast a long shadow, making Harry and his Ravenclaw companions question the motives behind their neighbor's absence from the Unity Forum. Was it simply Gryfinder arrogance, or was there something more sinister at play? This new question hung heavy in the air, a puzzle waiting to be unraveled. Candice then said, I'm sure that that Ron Weasley and Hermione Granger are the ones behind this whole scheme. They both hate Harry for not going into Gryfinder and becoming their friend, so they are plotting to bring him down. And that's their next mistake, said Harry. They wanted the boy who lived, but they're going to be surprised when they see that I'm not who they wanted me to be. A wry smile played on Harry's lips. Let them underestimate me, he said, his voice steady with a newfound resolve. They'll soon discover that Ravenclaw offers a different kind of magic, a power they won't be expecting. The weight of his words hung heavy in the air, a challenge issued not just to Ron and Hermione, but to the Gryfinder prejudice that had ostracized him. Candice, ever the strategist, leaned forward, her eyes gleaming with an echo of Harry's newfound determination. Excellent point, Harry, she said. Perhaps we can use this to our advantage. If Gryfinder intends to play their hand, we'll be ready. We'll be waiting. A sense of unity pulsed through the Ravenclaw common room, a quiet determination settling over the group. The initial shock of Gryfinder's snub had transformed into a strategic opportunity. With Harry as their unlikely champion, Ravenclaw was poised to not only defend itself, but to challenge the established power dynamic between the houses. The future, once shrouded in uncertainty, now crackled with a thrilling anticipation. This newfound resolve wasn't born out of vengeance, but out of a newfound sense of belonging. Ravenclaw House, known for its wit and wisdom, had always prided itself on its individuality. Yet, there was a power in unity, and Harry's presence had awakened that power within them. They weren't just a collection of brilliant minds, they were a force to be reckoned with. Eleanor, who moments ago had been fuming over Gryfinder's arrogance, straightened her posture, a newfound sense of purpose glinting in her eyes. We need a plan, Candice, she asserted. Gryfinder may be underestimating us, but that shouldn't give us the excuse to be unprepared. Duncan, the ever-skeptical Ravenclaw, nodded in agreement. We shouldn't underestimate Gryfinder either. There's more to their absence than meets the eye. They are planning something, and it's our job to figure out what it is before it's too late. The evening deepened, and as the fire crackled in the hearth, the Ravenclaw common room transformed into a war room of whispers and brainstorming. Harry, 
the catalyst for this newfound unity, found himself at the center of it all. He wasn't just a Ravenclaw by chance, he belonged here. And together, they would not only face the challenges that loomed ahead, but redefine what it meant to be a Ravenclaw.